Are we live in? Are we live, uh, Rodrigo? Yes, we are, we are live now and also recording. So, Tomaso, feel free to start anytime. Okay. So, Emmanuel, I will give a short introduction. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are honored to have uh, Professor Emmanuel Bloch as the speaker of the third plenary colloquium of the Brazilian Physical Society Annual Conference. Uh, Professor Immanuel Bloch obtained his PhD in physics in 2000 from uh, the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Uh, from 2003 to 2009, he was a, a full professor at the University of Mainz. And then uh, he returned to Munich, uh, where he is now scientific uh, director at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics uh, in Garching, and also professor of experimental physics uh, at uh, the Ludwig Maximilian University. He's also one of the spokespersons of the recently created the Munich Center for Quantum Science and uh, Technology. Uh, Professor Bloch's research focuses uh, on uh, the investigation of quantum anybody systems, uh, quantum simulation, quantum information processing, and quantum optics. And uh, uh, he, of course, received many, very many prizes for uh, his achievements, uh, among them the uh, Gottfried uh, Le Wilhelm Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation. Uh, the German National Merit Medal in 2005, and uh, the Senior BC Award and the Harvey Prize for, uh, of the Technion University, to mention just a few. He's also a member of several uh, uh, physical societies, uh, uh, among them the German, the European, and the American Physical Society, the German National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, uh, and is a scientific member of the Max Planck uh, Society. So the title of today's uh, colloquium is probing, probing Quantum Matter on a Large-Scale Atomic Quantum Simulator. Uh, Zoom participants can raise their hand to ask questions uh, that will be allowed uh, at the end. Also, I mean, with the, in presence with the, their mic uh, on. And the YouTube attendees uh, can interact with the speaker via chat that I, will, that, uh, I myself, or uh, Rodrigo will, will uh, read uh, at the end. So please, uh, Professor Emmanuel Bloch, uh, you can start. I will switch off uh, my microphone, but uh, if anything goes, uh, goes wrong, I will, uh, I will show up, uh, please. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, thanks a lot, Tommaso, for the kind introduction and Rodrigo for the invitation uh, to give a presentation here at the uh, Brazilian Physical Society meeting. So what I would like to talk about today is our work on um, quantum simulations in, with atoms in ultra-cold um, lattices. And um, so here's an outline of what I would like to tell you. So Tomas, you saw the slide is changing, no? Or is it okay? Yes, is it, okay, yeah, it's, it's totally okay. fine, yes. So I would first like to give you a brief introduction into the field of computers. Uh, in general, what we understand uh, in the field of quantum simulations and how it relates to quantum computing. And then I'll give you a few examples on specific quantum simulation of strongly correlated materials. And if we have time, I'd like to also talk about a very new topic, which we did uh, research on recently on non-equilibrium dynamics, so-called uh, new uh, KPZ, Kata parisi zhang um, transport class of anomalous superdiffusion. Okay, so what's the, our general goal? So you, you see this whole field of uh, quantum materials that uh, and you know, comes from the fundamental aspects of understanding these quantum antibody systems at a deep level and trying to, of course, then turn this knowledge into something technologically useful. And there are several examples of this that you can see here that uh, of materials materials with impact, superconductivity, magnetism, also of course chemistry, and a whole field of novel quantum sensors based on this field of um, basically quantum technologies is a very emerging and exciting. So one example we are going to uh, study to, today a lot is connected to strongly interacting electrons in, in, in a material, and specifically the problem of, of high TC superconductors, where I basically show you this phase diagram here from this review paper from Bernard Keimer, and we'll come uh, back to this topic uh, throughout the talk. Why are we choosing this problem? Well, because it's, I would say, the reference problem in material science. It's one of the biggest unsolved problems in material science. And it's also a very good reference problem for quantum computers and quantum simulators to compare themselves on. So if we have different machines that 
are supposed to do real science calculations, then we can use this really as a reference problem they can all try to solve and we can see how good are these different machines in solving these, uh, these problems. So in terms of a quantum simulation approach, what are we basically doing? Well, let's imagine you have a real material. Then I first need a theoretician to basically cast this uh, real material into a rule set, which is, of course, given by the underlying Hamiltonian of the system, which describes the behavior of the electrons in that solid. Uh, then I try to implement this uh, Hamiltonian in the lab in a system I will... Uh, tell you let for example this simulator run so it can solve for example the time evolution of the quantum system and then I measure the outcome of the simulator and feedback onto the experience of the real system. So that would be a typical cycle how this uh, quantum simulation approach works. There's another approach when you want to calculate ground state properties of many body systems for example which works the following way. You start for example with an initial Hamiltonian with a very well controlled initial state of your system and then you adiabatically change this Hamiltonian to the final Hamiltonian. Doing this very slowly you can by the adiabatic theorem guarantee that you will end up in the ground state of this final Hamiltonian and you have solved the problem of this final Hamiltonian. Now this final Hamiltonian could be a Hamiltonian of physics, of chemistry as I said, or also could be a problem related to optimization questions which we can map onto artificial, for example, spin problems. So by this way we can solve for the ground state of this final Hamiltonian and I would like to put this into the context of uh, adiabatic quantum computing. This is indeed exactly the approach one follows with an adiabatic quantum computer and we know that this is a universal way of doing quantum computing with the only downside we don't know how to implement error correction in this way. Now quantum simulation is doing exactly this is basically an adiabatic quantum computer but it does it in a restricted form. Typically in a quantum simulation you don't have all the degrees of freedom you need to perform a universal adiabatic quantum computation. Therefore we can think of quantum simulation as a restricted form as an, of an adiabatic quantum computer. So now I just mode of doing the simulation to the digital mode you've heard of about or maybe also in the context of quantum computing. So in the digital um, world, in the digital mode of quantum computers, you try to build up the Hamiltonian out of a universal gate set of single and two qubit operations. And by concatenating these qubit operations written down, for example, in this trotterized time evolution approach, you can build up the time evolution of an arbitrary model Hamiltonian that you can write down here. So the nice thing is, of course, that you can build up basically any model Hamiltonian out of very few elementary uh, gate operations in the system. The downside, of course, is that you might need a lot of qubits to do this effectively and you might need a lot of gate operations in the end for this to really work out in practice. So you might not be able to simulate what you want to do simply because of resource limitations and coherence in your system. In the analog way, on the other hand, as I said, we implement the model Hamiltonian directly in the system and therefore we can very often run this for much longer evolution times but the downside there is of course that we uh, cannot always implement any Hamiltonian you give me I have to live basically with what I can implement on my on my quantum many body system. What is interesting if you compare the two approaches and ask when should I use the analog simulator and when should I use the digital quantum computer you actually see that for actually most of the present day systems uh, you, you are doing much better if you perform this analog mode of operation if you can implement the system than rather than doing it the digital doing the calculation in this digital way. So we, we estimated this in a paper here uh, to, uh, to be submitted soon from Matthias Troja, Andrew Daly and Peter Zoller where we looked at the same kind of evolution of a strongly correlated electron system on an analog system and on a digital system and compared the resource requirements of the two and you can actually easily see in the digital system to achieve the performance of the analog system you need about a million gate operations with incredible fidelities of these systems so which is completely out of reach at moment. So the message is if you can do I think the analog way of computation today on these uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices you're actually always better in choosing this analog route today. Okay so now let's turn to the system that we are uh, these are ultra cold atoms trapped in optical lattices and here you can see a picture of an interference pattern of light realized by sending a laser beam through these five apertures here uh, and using a lens afterwards to refocus those laser beams and uh, now of course when they interfere 
you get a, a beautiful interference pattern and that's what you see actually on the screen and this fivefold um, slit or point pattern aperture pattern reflects in a fivefold symmetry of this quasi crystalline structure that you get in the interference pattern so this is the crystal of light that we make and we are able to trap atoms in these light fields in free space because they experience forces created by these light fields so called dipole forces and if we can make the atoms actually cold enough then these forces these potentials can be deep enough to trap the atoms in free space and vacuum and now we can study their behavior in this artificial crystals of light uh, we can typically do this with about a few thousand particles as i'll show you in a second and we can do this with uh, spin systems so qubits zero and ones but i think one big advantage of this platform uh, unique is that you can also directly simulate these particle Hamiltonians of bosons and fermions uh, which of course naturally uh, reflect for example what electrons are doing in a solid so you can use these fermionic qubits as I call them to efficiently address the problems of uh, fermionic uh, quantum many body systems actually if you want to have a look how this interference pattern was created a bit more I can refer you to this beautiful YouTube channel of, of Ted Hench who took these images so his uh, username is super laser the 123 YouTube channel and have a look how these uh, actually interference patterns were realized in the lab and there's some other beautiful actually optics experiments there as well that I can highly recommend to you. Okay, now that we know the system we're studying, let me show you a little bit uh, the tools of the trade that we use to study the quantum many body systems uh, in, the, uh, in the lab and that is the tool of quantum gas microscopy. So imagine uh, just for simplicity we have a many body wave function written down here as a capital psi which would be a coherent superposition of different configurations of the particles on the lattice and of course in principle there are also complex coefficients here which which I omit for a second and we can talk about that at the end of the talk and imagine now you would have a camera that can take snap snapshots of this with the single side resolution and single particle sensitivity so what would happen if you take such a snapshot a photograph of this of this system well then the wave function will collapse randomly onto one of the configurations in the system let's say maybe this one the yellow one you see marked here and this is the picture you will actually then see on your camera uh, that you recorded now of course after you made the photo the system is destroyed right it's a destructive measurement you are not in psi anymore you're in this collapsed state and if you want to study the system again you have to recreate psi again and then do another measurement the wave function will collapse onto another configuration most likely and then that's what you will see then and then you have to think of that you repeat this kind of experiment tens of thousands of times and by repeating this experiment tens of thousands of times you basically end up with a probability distribution of configurations namely you will know how often did you see this configuration how often did you see that configuration or how often did you see the third configuration here and from this probability distribution of con you can actually then calculate meaningful uh, correlation functions physical correlation functions that you can then use to interpret the behavior of the material what's interesting is if you have access to these single snapshots is that you can not only calculate two-point co uh, cor correlation function condensed matter physics but you can go beyond that you can quite create three calculate three point four point five point correlation functions and as we'll see in the talk these not only have academic value, they really are very crucial in understanding the uh, material in a novel way, in a deeper way. So for example, you could ask the question, how likely is it to have one atom here, two atoms over here, conditioned on having a hole in between? That would be a three-point three, three point correlation function. And we'll see uh, many more examples of this as we, as we go on in the talk. Okay, so here's a picture of how this actually looks in the lab. So we realize these optical lattices here actually we load a single plane uh, with atoms from this optical lattice so we create a two-dimensional plane uh, filled with these ultra cold atoms we load them into a lattice in this plane and then we start to shine near resonant light off the atoms the light is scattered collected by this high resolution objective and that's when the wave function collapses and when we basically take a photo of the system and here you can see pictures of this uh, single atom fluorescence image what you can see in the image is actually a single atom in this lattice 
So this is just a thermal state, so it's not a very interesting state, but you can really see, we can really nicely see each individual atom in, in this system. You can also control individual atoms uh, in the lattice by focusing a laser beam through this objective onto the atoms, and then we can move them around or rotate their spin states, and here you can just see a few patterns that we made just to show how efficiently this works. From patterns or this psi here in the lower right corner out of 26 individual atoms uh, that are placed on these lattice points uh, of the optical lattice uh, given here by these white 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 dots that you can see marking the actual optical lattice sites. Nowadays we're actually using a different technique to create these optical potentials which is even more flexible than just interfering um, different beams from different sides but we're using these so-called which are uh, arrays of micro mirrors which allow us to create almost arbitrary light potentials. We shine a Gaussian laser beam onto this micro mirror array and out comes the uh, basically target pattern of light that we want. So for example we can have a line of light, we could have more exotic lattices, we could have uh, two reservoirs, two boxes where we fill one box with atoms for example and study the transport of atoms from one box through this wire of light into the second box so you can study conductance through these thin wires of light. Or you just make a box potential like you show here if you just want to have homogeneous conditions, simple confinement in the system. So this works very well and uh, I'll show you a few examples of this in the, in the subsequent slides. So for example, we can take this DMD pattern. This is a digital mirror device. Each time you see a pixel white, it means the mirror is tilted. If it's black, the mirror or is not till shine a light field of this DMD pattern and this is the light field we get out of the uh, out of the system and if we suppose superimpose this light field on top of this optical lattice that you can see then you can really structure a pattern the uh, lattice structure in a way where you now have the two connected wires living here inside these empty regions of light uh, and separated by these boundaries, which are these high potential regions that you can see here. So this allows us to realize so-called quantum ladders, where you have two one-dimensional one systems coupled to each other, separated from other two-dimensional systems again. So this is actually a single snapshot fluorescence image, as the one I showed you before, of atoms loaded into the lattice, plus this um, structuring light field potential. And you can see indeed the atoms nicely uh, occupy only those sites where we want them to be. Uh, you can then average this, for example, for thousands of shots, and you can then record the average density distribution telling you, for example, how homogeneous are my potentials, uh, how are the atoms distributed in the system. Okay, we do this now, these techniques we now use to actually realize much larger systems also. So uh, some of the records we've been able to achieve in the lab are system size about 2,500 atoms. So really very, very large uh, atom systems as you can see here. Here they cooled a bit more where we basically now have a very homogeneous region of about 1,500 atoms and a few um, colder, hotter atoms at the outside boundary with the cold atoms remaining here in, in the center of the system. So these are pretty much the sizes of the systems we can look at today with these atoms. Okay, now that I've introduced you to the trapping potential and the detection techniques, let us turn to some physics problems and use these uh, systems and the detection technique to, to study some interesting physics. And I want to come back now to this problem of strongly interacting electrons uh, in, uh, in, in the system and uh, here's basically what, I can, what we can look at. We have a mixture of up and down electrons. The blue would be spin up and the red would be spin down electrons in the system uh, being loaded into this lattice potential. The atoms can tunnel from one lattice site to the next lattice site and they can interact on each side uh, by this interaction parameter u which is typically positive for our cases, the so-called Hubbard u parameter uh, telling us how much do the atoms repel each other. So if you want to spin down electron together on a site, it costs you U interaction energy and the atoms move through the lattice with kinetic energy T. Now at the so-called half filling point, this uh, Fermi Hubbard model of electrons on a lattice actually maps onto a so-called uh, Heisenberg model, an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. So effectively the Fermi Hubbard model in the regime of strong interactions uh, turns into an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg system where you can now think of this as a spin-spin interaction in the system with antiferromagnetic couplings. 
here given by this parameter j, which is related to these original Hubbard parameters via this, this expression here. This is the so-called super exchange spin coupling energy. So now if you compare this to the um, actual phase diagram here of the cuprates, you actually see for zero doping in the cuprates, you pretty much exactly are in this antiferromagnetic system. Uh, where if you have low enough temperatures, you see precisely this antiferromagnetic Heisenberg phase. And you see also the whole complexity starts as you start to introduce holes, mobile holes into the system, dopants, and you start to understand this phase. So if you ask me now, what is the essential question that we try to answer? Well, that's the competition of these mobile holes we introduce into the system by doping it with the magnetic ordering, with the antiferromagnetic ordering that we have present in the system. So that's the essential question we're trying to solve. And I want to give you two examples of this in, in the talk today. So let's start out by taking our 50-50 mixture of, of atoms now, fermionic atoms, in a lattice, mimicking the Fermi-Hubbard model, turn on structures and go low enough temperatures where we expect the system to be here in this nice two-dimensional antiferromagnetically ordered state. And if you take a fluorescence image of the atoms in that state, this is actually a beautiful experiment from a Markus Greiner's group in Harvard, you see the following picture up here on the right. You see that, again, you can see where the atoms are, but you have a problem since your fluorescence does not depend on the spin state, you don't know where the spin ups and the downs are. So what Marcus did was a clever trick, namely, he said, well, let's just remove, let's say, the spin down atoms in the system. So let's use a laser beam to blow out the spin down atoms. So you end up only with spin up atoms in the system. And now, now you can say, well, this must be a spin up atom because you removed the spin down ones. And where there's an empty site, that must have been the position of a spin down atom because that's basically what you removed. And if you're at unit filling, at half filling here in the system, then uh, basically that site must have been occupied. Now this works great in this regime and you can see these beautiful antiferromagnetic correlations that now become that you have reached this phase of antiferromagnetic order or antiferromagnetic correlations, we should better say in this, in this two-dimensional system. Now there's one problem with this detection technique, namely is if you introduce now a lot of holes here in the system, you have a problem because you don't know now if an empty site you are seeing actually here, if that is an empty site or if that's a spin down atom. Yeah, is it a true hole that you have introduced on the system or is it actually a, a spin down atom? So you have this ambiguity that you cannot resolve. However, that we need to resolve because we want to again, remember, study the interplay of these holes with the antiferromagnetic background. So we have to do a bit better than that. And for that, we invented a new uh, detection technique that allows us to do that to have full spin and density resolution of these uh, quantum many body systems. So here's a sketch of how this works. Imagine you have now a 2D system with spin up and downs on this lattice. You have some uh, empty sites, you have some doubly occupied sites, and now you want to image this. So this is the physical system you want to image. Now for the detection process, we're going to do the following trick. We're going to separate this one physical layer into two layers we're going to pull the spin down atoms into the upper layer and the spin up atoms into the lower layer and then take two subsequent images of these layers. So first, so this is the physical system. So now for detection we separate it and now we take the image, then we take an image of the upper plane uh, which we know are the spin ups and downs in the system. We put them together to get the original um, uh, construction uh, population of the lattice. Actually, if I have time in the end, I will tell you how it's done, but let me skip that for now. And let me just show you some images that this works nicely. So you start out with a physical monolayer. You end up for detection. This is a photo now of the uh, up uh, spins. This is a photo of the down spins. And then you can reconstruct the positions of the atoms on the lattice and you can put everything together to get a full spin and density resolved image of the, okay? So now you know where the spin ups are, where the spin downs are, where the holes are, where the doubly occupied sites are. Uh, so you know everything about the system. 
So if you coming from quantum Monte Carlo simulation, this is like getting a snapshot from your quantum Monte Carlo simulation. Of course, with the difference that this is not a simulation, but this is the real physical system that we're, we're studying in the lab in this quantum simulation approach. Okay, let me give you now examples uh, where we apply this. Uh, and the first example I want to show is the example of uh, spin charge separation in a many body system. And it's actually a quite striking example showing also the power of this approach. So imagine you have an electron uh, which has two quantum numbers, the charge quantum number minus e and the spin one-half quantum number. And you know because the electron is an elementary particle, these quantum numbers are undivisible, are attached to the electron. But uh, what actually is quite strange and what we'll see in a second is if you inject such an electron into a many-body system, into a special many-body system, then it can disintegrate actually into two quasi-particles one of them carrying the charge quantum number and one of them carrying the spin quantum number. And both of these new quasi-particles can now separate over arbitrary distances so they can do what's impossible in free space. They can fragment, uh, fractionalize our original electron into two objects carrying the two quantum numbers. And this is why this process is called fractionalization. It also is known under the term of deconfinement of those quasi-particles because in, in this special situation that we will discuss, these quasi-particles can separate over arbitrary distances. All right, so here's the setting that we discussed. We have a one-dimensional chain, a one-dimensional Heisenberg chain, which I'm depicting the antiferromagnetic order now in a cartoon picture as this nail order of up, down, up, down, up, down spins. But remember, we're actually talking about a Heisenberg antiferromagnet. So just as a cartoon, I draw it as this classical nail state. And now what I will do from the system, I can either inject an atom into the system or I can also equivalently remove an atom from the system. And we can do this by shining a laser beam onto one side, this atom on that one side. Now what happens then in the subsequent time evolution is uh, sketched here. Uh, so you will basically have this hole that you created now starts to move, it starts to tunnel in the system. And there's basically now this one quasi-particle that's created the so-called charge on, which carries the charge quantum number. And, but there's another object created over here that you can see these two upspins connected to each other, which is the so-called spin on, which is a spin one half object. And these two quasi-particles can now separate over arbitrary distances. So indeed you've done what I told you you can do. You can separate this original hole or atom that you removed into a spin one half object and a charge object which can separate over arbitrary distances as they move. One way to detect these objects is to actually detect them via their very different propagation velocities. So these quasi-particles have very different um, dispersion relations. So they have very different propagation velocities in the host medium. And this is something we can, we can see in a very, very direct way. So let me walk you through this graph. So here's the position on the one-dimensional lattice. Here's evolution time on the vertical axis in hopping times. And at time t equals zero, the initial time, we remove one atom from the system at a position zero. So we create a hole here with high probability. Uh, so we have created, if I plot the whole density, it's very high here. So now as time goes on, you will see that this uh, hole will now start to tunnel and basically it quantum random walk. And this will give rise to a probability distribution after a certain uh, amount of evolution time that we can here measure then after some evolution time. So this is just the measured data. You see this has a nice outer cone and it also has some interfaces quite characteristic for the quantum walk. And from the width of this distribution, we can actually directly determine the propagation velocity. We can just measure the width as a function of time gives us the propagation velocity. For the magnetic part, for the spin on, we can do something. We can take the so-called spin-spin correlator. So we're looking at spin correlations on neighboring sites. And we measure that as a function of evolution time. And we also see it has a cone-like structure. There's not so much interference in the core. That's basically because we are doing this at slightly elevated temperatures, which preclude this um, interference structure in the spin sector so far. But still, there's a nice cone also visible from which we can extract a propagation velocity. 
So now to determine the velocities in the system, I just plot the width of those distributions, of the whole distribution and the distribution. And you can indeed see uh, these slopes tell us they have very, very different propagation velocities corresponding to these two quasi-particles in the system. Now, one thing I promised you, I would sh show you how, why these higher order correlation functions are important. And here's now a first example where they can really nicely show this fractionalization process in a much more direct way than you can ever do with a two-point correlator. So I am introducing this three-point correlation essentially measures the spin correlation around a hole. Okay, so you measure how is the spin on this side correlated with the spin on this side conditioned on having a hole in between. So this correlator tells you how are the spins around a hole aligned. Okay, if it's positive, they are positively aligned. If it's negative, they are anti-aligned. So if you do this at time t equals zero and you kick out this uh, atom, nothing will have reacted in the spin sector. So basically those two atoms will have uh, still be positively aligned. So you start out with a positive spin hole spin correlator. But as time evolves, as the spinon moves away uh, from the holon, the holon propagating here to the right and the spinon here propagating to the left, you see actually that the spin hole spin correlator, the spin correlations around the hole now, because the spinon has moved away from the holon, and now you are just having the background uh, spin correlations around this hole. So in a way, you can directly see this fractionalization in this three-point correlator by this spin hole spin correlator turning from positive as the spin on moves away from the hole on. And this is indeed what we see in the experiment. So you start out with this positive spin hole spin correlation at time t equals zero. And as time evolves, you can see how they actually turn negative uh, corresponding to the spin on having now the um, spin environment around the hole being actually negative. Okay, uh, let me actually show you how this um, dynamical uh, experiment that we've been doing to see this so-called spin charge separation, the fractionalization, is actually related to a peculiar hidden order in the ground state of this one-dimensional system. So we go back to our 1D chain and we now uh, dope it with holes and we want to find the lowest energy state, the ground state of the system. Now, the ground state of this system is determined by two competing uh, conditions. On the one hand, the holes want to delocalize to minimize kinetic energy, but the spins in the system, they want to align antiferromagnetically according to this uh, antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. And we have to find a state which satisfies both those conditions in an optimal way to give us uh, the lowest energy state. Turns out the ground state in this cartoonish picture that satisfies this condition is the following one, where the hole is delocalized over the entire lattice, so you have energy, but at the same time, the spin configuration around holes is antiferromagnetic. So for example, when this atom hops into this empty site, or the hole alternatively hops over here, there's now antiferromagnetic alignment between those two spins. So that's the optimal configuration uh, that you can reach. So this would be the ground state of the system. So if you look at this a bit more careful, you see actually that each time there is a hole in such a one-dimensional antiferromagnet, this is like a parity flip in the uh, antiferromagnetic background. If I determine this ordering of the antiferromagnet by, for example, down, up, down, up, down, up as being parity plus one, or up, down, up, down, the conjugate ordering as minus one, then you see that each time we cross one of those holes, the parity of the antiferromagnet is flipped from plus one to minus one to plus one to minus one. And back. I call this hole in one the atopological excitation because the hole not only affects what's happening directly in the vicinity of the hole, but it really affects the entire system because it really affects the ordering of the antiferromagnet even you know thousands of sites away. So now we can measure this, and uh, let me show you that we can indeed see this topological uh, non-local ordering uh, effect of these holes uh, uh, through these kind of non-local correlators, these spin-hole spin correlators. So again, we're looking at the three-point correlator, asking how is the spin on site I correlated with the spin on site I plus D, condition on having a hole at site S. 
Okay, so we are, and, and there can be now two, co two conditions for this hole. So either S is larger than D, so the hole would be outside of the region of the two spins that we're correlating, or the hole S is smaller than D between those two spins that we're correlating. Okay. On whether the hole is between or not, remember that induced a spin flip in the antiferromagnetic ordering or not. And this is what we can actually see. So here's on the vertical axis, the position of the hole. On the horizontal axis, there's the distance of the two spins. And if S is larger than D, we're in this upper sector. So if I now measure the two-point spin correlation function, you see this ordering down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. But if I now go below the situation where S is smaller than D, then you can see how red has turned into blue and blue has turned into red, where this parity has been precisely flipped. And you can see this even more pronounced if I just remove this plus one, plus minus one, always staggering of the antiferromagnet. You can see the parodies of these antiferromagnetic orderings direct hole is between those two blocks or not. Yeah. So that's a very nice way of seeing this non-local effect of this one hole. And now that you understood what one hole does, you really also understood what many holes are doing because each time you cross one of those holes, magnetic background basically flips. Yeah, so you really can directly see how this uh, ordering uh, works out with many, many holes in the system. And if you look at this a bit closer, the cartoon, you actually see, well, if I went to a fictitious space all the holes i went to a so-called squeeze space where i squeezed out all the holes then you can see uh, after an up spin i always have a down spin and after a down spin i always have an up spin and you basically have a perfect antiferromagnetic heisenberg model back again so in this fictitious squeeze space defined by the position of the electrons in my lattice uh, i basically can see i have a perfect heisenberg antiferromagnetic again go to this this squeeze space picture so this also is a what i'm telling you here in this cartoon picture is actually a precise mathematical result coming from the so-called beta ansatz solution of this 1d problem derived uh, by Wojnarowicz and ogata and shiba in 82 and the 90s in the limit of infinitely strong repulsive interactions you can indeed write this many body wave function of the electrons on the lattice as a product wave function of spin fermion positions where do these electrons sit on my original lattice multiplied by an antiferromagnetic heisenberg part living at the positions of these electrons this factorization of the wave function into a density part and a magnetism part this is really the manifestation of spin charge separation in the ground state of this quantum anybody system the factorization into density and magnetic parts which live into completely different sectors is beautifully seen also in the ground state uh, wave function. All right. Um, yeah, let me show you that you can indeed see this. So here I'm now looking at experimental data of this one dimensional chain with a lot of holes doped into the system between 50 and 80% doping. And I'm looking now first at just a two point correlation function as a function of D of the spins I'm correlating. If the distance is one uh, over here, this means each other. And if they sit right next to each other, they of course aligned. If they have a larger distance, let's say these spins have, a, let's say, five sides between them, then there can be a chance of having random number of holes between them. And remember, if there are random number of holes in between them, this can fluctuate. This leads to flipping of the spins on the two ends. If I just measure the two-point correlation function, I will not be able to see uh, the, the effect of the holes directly, but I can just see this random flipping, which in the end in the correlation function averages out to zero correlations. So this is the data. And if I give you this data, there's no interesting magnetic structure in this 1D system. Just when they're next neighbor, there's basically they're antiferromagnetically aligned. But now if I take into account this effect of the holes and do the same analysis in squeeze space, or alternatively through a so-called string correlation function, then you can see that you can more in this system. There is a nice antiferromagnetic structure here just living in this you know, squeeze space. Uh, 
which you can only have access to when you also detect where the holes are and you can remove them from the system. So now you can see this hidden antiferromagnetic correlations in the system that can directly become visible to you, but only because you have this full view, microscopic view of the wave function. You really see every spin up and down, every hole in the system. Only then are you able to see this novel kind of uh, uh, correlations that you can have in the system. All right, let me now uh, move to a 2D system and show you how this actually works in 2D. And uh, the question we're asking is precisely the same question again. Two-dimensional antiferromagnet now. We put a mobile hole in it and we ask how does this uh, mobile hole affect now in the system. And uh, that this is an interesting ex uh, Gedanken experiment you can already see from this paper from 1989 by Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and Nick Reed, you know, some of the three greatest minds in theoretical condensed matter physicists of our time, who looked at precisely this, this Gedanken experiment, motion of a single hole in a quantum antiferromagnet. Okay, uh, that shows you that like, must be a non-trivial problem if it takes three, these three guys to, to look at it. So what's different in 2D from 1D? So let's go through this uh, in this cartoon picture again. This is a 2D system. Again, remember, we want to find a state which minimizes magnetic and kinetic energy. And now we can put a hole in here, or alternatively, for experimental reasons, we like to put up lawns here, which is exactly the same as putting a hole. So you can do the same arguments with holes, but let me do this with doublons now, because that corresponds to what we will see in the experiment in a second. And now we want this uh, to move now, this hole. So let's say this... or doublon moves us, so this spin up moves from this side to this side, so the doublon has moved over here, and then you actually see in difference to the 1D case, now you have left behind a string of flipped spins of these aligned spins. And these aligned spins, they actually cost you energy because remember it's an antiferromagnetic model, but now you have ferromagnetic alignment, so this will cost you some magnetic energy cost. So, but, but you've gained kinetic energy, you've lowered your kinetic energy by delocalizing the particle and the doublon. Let's move the doublon more. The doublon has moved more, has reduced its kinetic energy more, but now you see, oh, I've left behind even more flipped spins, so this has cost me even more uh, magnetic energy. So you immediately you see what happened in 1D cannot happen in 2D, doublon moves over arbitrary distances in the system because it would leave behind more and more flipped spins and that would cost an infinite amount of magnetic energy cost uh, in the system and that, that cannot happen. So something different, something fundamentally different happens here. And what happens happens here what is that instead of um, basically separating um, the doublon and the spinon part is that you form a polaron uh, in the system where you have the mobile impurity, the hole or doublon, surrounded by modified magnetic correlations in the vicinity with the reduced antiferromagnetic correlations or in extreme conditions this could even be ferromagnetic correlations within the bubble. So within the bubble now the uh, hole can move easily, can delocalize, but it cannot do that over the entire system. And then this object, of course, would be in a superposition of being everywhere on my lattice. So this is now the polaron solution, the spin polaron forming around this uh, mobile impurity that we, that we can see in the system. Now, of course, there are many examples for literature of these impurities modifying their surrounding medium. But I think it was never possible to really take a microscopic picture of such a polaron as seeing how this single impurity modifies the surround, its surrounding and indeed that we can do this. So here's a picture of the spin correlations surrounding a mobile doublon. So we remember we take these photos, we see where all the spin ups and downs and doublons are. For example, the doublon is here. And then we look at the spin correlations uh, of these two sides here conditioned on having the doublon here in the center. Okay, so this would be the horizontal string correlator, this would be spin correlator, this would be vertical spin correlator between these two spins. And the colors here shows you just the strength of the spin correlation between those two spins, the SZ, SZ spin correlation. 
And what you can actually see now, what's nice in the vicinity of this Dublon, of this mobile Dublon, you see these modified spin correlations compared to the background. If you go far away from the Dublon, you see this white spin correlations giving a value of minus 0.18, which shows you that in the vicinity of the Dublon, you have this distorted antiferromagnetic correlations. This becomes even more striking if you look at the diagonal correlations. These spin spin correlates here, there you even have a complete sign reversal of in the vicinity uh, of this of this mobile impurity in the system. And we can do this also with uh, longer range correlations. And I think what's nice is that we have a really not dependent picture of these uh, spin correlations around these mobile impurities that we can uh, we, you can use in the experiment. Just as a teaser, if you want to learn a bit more about it, I won't go into much more details of this, but uh, what's interesting now is, is what happens if you uh, dope the system much more in 2D. So you start with the antiferromagnet. If you have a little bit of doping, I told you how you get the polarons, but then when you dope a lot, actually it turns out from condensed matter measurements, we know that the system actually turns over from this polaronic metal with positively charged carriers, uh, the holes here, it turns over into a Fermi liquid here where the electrons again become the standard charge carriers. So you have very different metals that are living on these two sides, the polaronic metal and the Fermi liquid uh, metal over here. And you ask what's actually happening as you dope the system more and more, how is this crossover happening? And in this is publication here down here, uh, which is on the archive, you can actually see how we use different microscopic quantities that we can now directly see what's happening, when is this crossover happening, how is it happening microscopically, at what doping level is this crossover happening, and we find that about 20 to 30 percent dopings, this change from the polaronic metal to the Fermi liquid metal is basically completed. Okay, uh, finally, something just quickly new, just to show you we can not only do, you know, strongly correlated electrons, but we can uh, do some more interesting things also. I want to give you a very new experiment on the non-equilibrium dynamics of, of um, Heisenberg um, magnets, quantum magnets. That is actually quite interesting. That has been something that has came out of the literature in the last few years only uh, to understand really in new features of the transport in the Heisenberg model. So the model we are studying is again the, the Heisenberg model. Ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic doesn't matter because we're going to study it in a very high temperature regime, in a very large temperature regime, very large excitation regime. And um, we're going to study it at the isotropic point where the couplings in front of those xx, y, y, and zz terms are all equal. And we're going to ask what is the nature of the spin transport at this isotropic Heisenberg point. And what is really remarkable, and that again goes back to unique work from Tomasz Posen's group in 2017 and, and onwards only, that they found that actually there's a very, type, very special type of um, super diffusive transport uh, in, in this regime where space and uh, time are related by this 1 over z with z being the dynamical exponent in the system where in the super diffusive regime here we find a dynamical exponent of the three halves between ballistic and diffusive transport and that was completely unexpected so that's completely new and that's remarkable because the heisenberg model you would have thought every thought in the heisenberg model right Turns out what's interesting about this uh, is that it is actually connected to a completely different field of statistical physics, the so-called uh, Kada parisi zhang equation, which actually governs the growth of interfaces coming from classical statistical physics. So where you can study, for example, you have a deposition of uh, material on a layer and you have this very peculiar kind of growth process with the height field described by this uh, nonlinear partial differential equation. So that was again something that remarkable that one could connect these two completely different fields. The way how we can study this process, how we can sp study this spin transport is to set up a non-equilibrium situation uh, for the spins in the system. So we create a system where the left half of our box is filled with spin up atoms and the right half of the box is filled with spin up down atoms. So we have an interface 
a really very sharp interface of spin up and spin down domain wall interface and then we let the system evolve under the action of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian and we see after some evolution times how for example the spin up atoms penetrate into the spin down region and the spin down atoms penetrate into the spin up region. And from this we can actually measure uh, the spin transport, we can measure how many spins have moved into the other region of space uh, measuring this polarization transfer as a function of time and this allows us to directly access this dynamical exponent z. And uh, we can also measure the uh, spin density profiles in the system and you can actually see if we measure the polarization transfer it's neither ballistic which would be this violet line nor is it diffusive which would be the red line but indeed on this uh, log log plot if we fit to the z equal 3 half uh, part here we can indeed see that it's indeed as prediction numerics tells us indeed the super diffusive transport that we see here. Now it turns out the super diffusive transitive on both having an integrable model uh, which uh, the ha this um, Fermi Hubbard model is only in, in 1D or um, um, well actually it's the Bose Hubbard model here only in 1D that we're studying or basically breaking the SU2 symmetry and we can test both of those things in the experiment. So we can on the one hand break the integrability of the model by going from 1D to 2D and what goes back to diffusive. Okay, so it's indeed very sensitive on the integrability. Or we can break a magnetization in the system so we can now break SU2 symmetry by having let's say more spin ups than spin downs in the system. And if we do that, you can immediately see how the spin polarization profiles look very different in this magnetized case from the unmagnetized case. And we also get to completely different transport behavior. Um, one final thing maybe that's the most conclusive thing for this new type of transport in the system, if we look at the statistics of polarization transfer. So how often do we see a certain number of spins being transferred in a certain evolution time? we see that this approaches a very special distribution function, the so-called tracy widom distribution function, which is actually the hallmark signature of seeing this KPZ type of transport in these quantum magnets. So here I just summarize these final results before concluding. On this non-equilibrium dynamics, we see that in the Heisenberg model at very high temperatures, we indeed see super diffusive transport with a dynamical exponent of 3 half. If we break SU2 symmetry, we go to ballistic transport. If we break uh, integrability, we go to diffusive transport with a dynamical exponent of 2. So we can really uncover all those different transport regimes and especially this very new transport regime of KPZ type super diffusive transport in the Heisenberg model. All right, um, just briefly, where do we go next from here? So uh, we are right now working hard to scale our systems to go to even larger systems by making larger laser beams and to make larger laser beams we have to go to optical cavities because we don't have infinite laser power available and these cavities allow us to use the available laser power much more efficiently to make really very large beams, uh, very large optical crystals and we hope very soon we can go to system sizes of tens of thousands of particles in these systems and study them and also learn from the Eintrap community and the tweezer community to bring kind of this exquisite control we have for example in the Eintraps to these, to these atoms in optical lattices combine the large scale of the system with this kind of pristine control levels we have in the smaller systems. Um, we are also working on new laser sources um, to perfection this, this way of you know, projecting arbitrary potentials to really bring a level of programmability to the system where you could, let's say as a theorist, come to me in the lab and tell me I want exactly this lattice structure with this and this coupling and then I just have to turn on my digital mirror device and it gives you exactly this pattern and you can study for you the behavior of these atoms in this lattice potentials. Okay, with that, I, I want to thank you a lot for your attention. I just today gave you a brief introduction into selected aspects of, of what we're studying in, 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 in Munich in these systems, and they are exciting systems for studying uh, artificial quantum many body systems. And I hope I could show you how this new level of um, detection and control we now have available, not only in the cold atom systems, but I think in general in these um, artificial 
quantum systems um, really give us a beautiful in new insight into, into quantum many-body physics. Finally, let me just briefly um, highlight the people who did the work in Munich. The fermionic uh, quantum gas team, the lithium quantum gas team, Jaya did the spin charge separation, Janis uh, the Polaron experiments, Dominic and Zara and Peter are the new PhD students. Christian led the experiment, he's now a professor in Tübingen. Uh, Mim and Guillaume were the senior postdocs on the experiment, Thomas is the new postdoc on the experiment, and a lot of this was done between Demler, Yao Wang, Fabian Grust, and Annabel Bord. And on the last part of the KPZ transport, this was basically the work of, of David Wei, a really great uh, PhD student on this experiment. And again, the team was also led by Christian, and um, who again yeah, left and now switched over to Johannes, who is now leading, leading the experiments and also done the KPZ type transport. All right, with that, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, brings me to the end, and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any of your questions. Great, uh, Immanuel, can you hear me? Back? Yeah, sounds okay, good. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Uh, I will leave now the floor to, to our participants, uh, if anyone has any question. So we first have a question by Eric uh, here in the chat. Uh, of course, uh, Immanuel, you talked about applications regarding uh, essentially some specific model in condensed matter. And then the last part also to applications, I would say to more general principle in statistical physics. But uh, this uh, Eric is asking, for example, if you can uh, mention uh, if you, there, there are applications, for example, in elementary particles. Sorry, in other fields. In which field? In which field of elementary, elementary particles or ah. high energy physics? Yeah. So yes, something uh, my group is not working, but for example, my colleague in Munich, Monika Eidelsberger, she's working in this direction, so-called dynamical gauge fields. So you can not only, you can implement, uh, I, I really just scratched the basics of the lattices you can realize. You can realize lattices with complex hopping amplitudes, or you can realize uh, lattices with dynamical hopping amplitudes. And this can then help you to realize, uh, you know, dynamical gauge fields, then of course, have a strong connection to elementary particle physics, to nuclear physics, and that's one aim of the field in the future to push into this direction as well. Absolutely. Great. So another question by uh, Carlos Egis. So excellent talk. Thanks. Can the simulation help us understand the fundamental microscopic mechanism for high energy superconductivity? Sorry, you were interrupted, Tommaso. Can you just repeat ah, the last yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, so, excellent talk. Uh, can these sim simulations help us understand the fundamental microscopic mechanism for high temperature superconductivity? Uh, well, we hope it will. I mean, I, let me go back to the phase diagram and. Um... We hope so, yes. I mean, eventually. I mean, we are, right now, we are still at uh, rather elevated temperatures. Uh, but already here, a lot of exciting stuff is going on and a lot of stuff that people don't understand. Of course, the real big question, you know, whether there's D-wave superconductivity is, 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 is maybe happening at lower temperatures. And we, we have to push, we have a push to, you know, go to lower temperatures in these systems. Now, when, we, when I say, will it solve high TC superconductivity, I have to be a bit careful. What I always say more precisely, it hopefully will help us say whether the phenomena of high TC is contained within the Hubbard model or variants of the Hubbard model. It could, of course, be that you know real materials are much more complex than the, the simple plain vanilla Hubbard model or simple extensions. And we can try to make our models more and more complex, which is what we try to do. Uh, but but I, we have to maybe be a bit more careful with this statement. But yes, of course, the goal is to, to understand really, as I said, this fundamental interplay of doping with magnetism. This is the essential question. I think there we can there we can cont contribute. A great demand. So we have another question by Fernando De Melo. So in uh, in the ten thousand uh, atom experiments, so the larger system sizes that we are showing. Uh, how can we? Uh, how can one be sure to have a single atom per site? Is there? Is this an issue? And even uh, even for smaller experiments, uh, how sensitive is the fluorescence measurement? 
Okay, you are breaking away in the end again, but I think I got the question so well. We do it by detection, right? I mean, if we have we we have to prepare the system at low enough temperature so that um, you know we we strong interaction regime. We have just one atom per site and no defects. Of course, the part you know the the holes and doublons they are part of the model. They are part in the Fermi Hubbard model. They they even exist at zero temperature. So we have to distinguish between. They, 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 between unwanted holes, so to say, and holes that are part of the physical model, part of the solved problem we're trying. So we are basically, in our experiments, we're relying on the atoms sorting themselves completely um, by the underlying physics, by the many body physics of the mod insulator that forms. In the tweezer experiments, uh, you might have heard about this an interesting alternative approach where you actively sort atoms to put, let's say, one atom on a lattice side to make completely defect-free arrays. But keep in mind, these defect-free arrays are only the ground states for very strong interactions. Once you again, when you put, um, you know, lower interactions, more tunneling into the system, you have to have also defects in these systems, which are the quantum, quantum part uh, of quantum fluctuations of this problem. So maybe Imanu, just uh, from my perspective uh, that uh, I, I know a little bit the platforms. Uh, so there are of course differences between the, the standard optical lattices and the optical tweezers, for example, in terms of typical uh, lattice distances that you, can, uh, that you can obtain. So probably you can comment also regarding the type of models of physical systems or physical models that you can uh, actually uh, realize because uh, maybe the, the type of Eisenberg uh, model that you were talking about is best suited for these standard optical lattices uh, experiments. Whereas for uh, maybe for uh, optical tweezers, so you will need uh, some sort of stronger long range interactions to make uh, uh, the mapping to some nice and uh, physically interesting uh, interactive models. Is it correct? Do you share this, this opinion? Well, at least it's much harder. Well, first of all, um, there have been now also ways how to combine tweezers, how to load it with the tweezer and then load the tweezer into a lattice and then do the lattice for tweezer array as an efficient way of preparing, uh, let's say, unit occupation in the lattice. And then, but then the physics is exactly the physics I described to you. And then there's the other aspect you described where plain vanilla in the Rydberg systems with tweezers, you mostly are simulating more quantum icing type models with the SZ, SZ interaction. And whereas we are very naturally simulating directly the Heisenberg, uh, isotropic Heisenberg point. And we can both, I guess, tune away from these points, but the natural ones in the Rydberg system is the nail point and the natural one for us is the Heisenberg point. But of course, both platforms aim to go away from these points and, and uh, explore regions beyond that. Yes. Okay, we have a question by uh, Fabrizio Oliviero. So Fabrizio, if you can uh, switch on your mic, please. Uh, yes, please. Okay, okay, are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks for Professor Block for this nice, nice talk. Uh, my question is really close to the question did by Tommaso. I mean, in this, talk, in, this, in this meeting, a lot of people are talking about twisted bilayer graphene that you can obtain by taking a uh, uh, graphene monolayer stacking to another one. And for some edge, magic angle, you can obtain some kind of uh, exotic superconductivity behavior. I mean, is it, is it possible to obtain something really similar here by creating Super, uh, I mean, uh, different superlaterals by stacking one superlaterals uh, upon another one and find some some kind of uh, strange behavior. I mean, different different behavior like this Q rates you you're looking for here. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're asking. So, well, first of all, we we did in the experiment already. We and others also did some bilayer physics where you have couple two dimensional uh, layers but what you are asking is more can you do that with a twist angle um, in the system that has not been done experimentally although there are proposals how you could do this actually with these systems for example you could have two uh, spin states in the atom one of them sees one type of lattice sees a slightly rotated type of lattice and then you could have a laser beam that couples those two spin states. So you could also have tunable couplings between the layers 
that share a certain angle to them. So that's, I think, a very exciting uh, prospect, very exciting direction one, one could follow. But it has only been proposed theoretically so far, and I don't think anybody has done that in the experiment so far. But it's a very interesting direction. OK, guys, other questions? I have a, maybe, a, a, I don't know if it is too technical, uh, Emmanuel, but regarding that impurity in the 2D uh, platform into the setup. So you were talking about that uh, by moving uh, the impurity, you will get uh, uh, sufficiently high magnetic energy and you can lower the uh, kinetic energy. And so in some sense, I would expect that uh, since energy is of course conserved, that this impurity cannot move uh, too far if you leave it uh, uh, for a sufficiently large amount of time. Absolutely. Is it a sort of correct interpretation. Absolutely, and yeah. yeah. And then my, my, my other sort of related question is this sort of mechanism uh, related uh, in a way to confinement of uh, impurity due to an external background or cannot, we cannot relate it to some sort of confinement mechanism? Well, it is kind of a confinement. <laughs> yeah, a little bit there is this, this thing, this impurity cannot separate from the background. So if this impurity moves, not only the impurity moves, but the whole bag with co modified correlations around it has to move as well. So you immediately see this object has to have a completely different dispersion relation. And uh, then of course, the you know if this impurity moves and the magnetic background has to modify while it moves around it, this will be something of the exchange energy. So it will have something which can move much uh, less fast than a single hole, but it will be something that has to do with the with the exchange energy in the system. And yes, I think you can think of, I think Eugene and Fabian, they put around even a picture in 2D, which is very much related to nuclear physics, like a meson type picture, where you can think of this uh, hole on bound to a string of, of splash to each other. So we can really effectively think of such, such, such models from you know, nuclear physics that describe these, these polaron objects, indeed. Okay. Thanks. We have another question by uh, Igor Para. Please, Igor, you can uh, switch on your mic. Okay. Yes, you can ask now the question. But I think we cannot hear you. Okay, can you... Maybe there is a connection problem with Igor. We have, okay, we have an additional quest. So please, Rodrigo, you, you can maybe uh, go ask first and then Igor, if he solves the, the problem, uh, he can ask then. Please, Rodrigo. Okay, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about the three-point correlation functions. Uh, the one you mentioned had the, the SC component uh, of the spin operator. I was wondering if it's possible to measure uh, different components. I'm thinking of a spin chirality, like SX, SY, SZ on, on neighboring sites. Yeah, very good question. So that's really, in principle, yes. In practice, we didn't do it. So what's easy, uh, for example, for this three-point correlator, if I just want to, instead of SZ, SZ, want to measure XX or YY, because that just means I have to do a global basis rotation before my detection of the spins, right? So I just, overall, my system, I can do some pi over 2 rotation or something. What you're asking is maybe, let me correlate, have here SX and here SY. That should be possible in the future because with local addressing, you can change the measurement basis locally before the detection. So you can do a spin rotation on one side, you know, before the, if you do the detection always in the Z axis, but you do a spin rotation on that side before the detection, then you can measure in the arbitrary basis on that side. So indeed you could measure the spin chirality be accessible, absolutely. And I highly encourage you to think about these quantities because I think people have not, most condensed matter physicists have not thought about these quantities enough, I think, because they are usually not detectable in a standard condensed matter experiment. But now we really can see these objects, and I think it's really worthwhile thinking about how these different phases of matter manifest in these maybe 
strange non-local correlation functions, how their properties are encoded in these strange non-local correlation functions. I think it's really a good direction to think. So Igor, maybe you can try again asking the questions, unless Rodrigo has another one. Uh, no, please go ahead, uh, Igor. If, uh... Let's see if Igor, uh, you want to try again, maybe? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Igor, please. Yeah. Hi, I have just a, a curiosity about that pattern of light that you showed, uh, that pattern of light that, uh, that was produced when the light passed uh, through five points. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, my question is, is it possible to pass a laser over, for example, uh, a, a semi sphere to produce a kind of Mercato projection uh, uh, of light? Uh, I think uh, uh, it's possible to 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 project a, a covert space in in, in spider of light. Well, anything you can Fourier synthesize in this plane, you can you can basically build up. So what you are thinking is more like going from a higher dimensional system to a lower dimensional one to realize a quasi crystal structure, for example. Um, yeah. I mean, with the, the advantage with the, the, the new approach we have with the DMD system, you can just directly project any pattern you want. So the, that's why we like this. This this is depending on the Fourier synthesis, synthesis, but with this method, let me go to this slide again where I had this one moment. Sorry, it's a bit high here. With this technique, you know, you can just give me directly the real space lattice potential you want. And I can then just project it onto the atoms. So if you want this 1D line with Fibonacci, uh, let's say series, then we can we can do that. Okay, Imano. So we have uh, other couple of questions from uh, uh, our YouTube participants. Mm -hmm. So one of them uh, by Eitor da Silva is. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, in the talk was mentioned the analog and digital quantum simulators. Uh, is there any possibility of having a, a hybrid uh, quantum simulator approach? So combining both uh, uh, analog and uh, digital. Um, yes, I think yes, I think this is this is a very good question. I don't think really anybody has tried this so much uh, so far, but I, I actually completely agree. There have been well, there have been some variational quantum simulation where I think related approaches have been used, where you basically have analog degrees of freedom that you then apply for a certain amount of time and give feedback uh, through a classical computer a representation of the wave function in an, in an optimal way. And um, yes, I think also a lot of the stuff that has been done in, let's say, Floquet dynamics, uh, where you stroboscopically pulse on the different terms for a certain amount of time, I think would fall in the category that you're talking about. So, so indeed, I think this is much more connected than it seems. I mean, this digital and analog is not like two worlds. This is very, very, very connected. And uh, you typically, if you can do one thing in one system, you can also do the other thing in, in the system as well. So I think they are really very connected. And I think we have seen already also things where they have been applied together. OK, great. We have another question by Patricia Castillo. Uh, thank you very Thank you for the very nice talk uh, about your last result, uh, where you looked uh, to the diffusion of atoms up uh, into the down domain and vice versa. Is it possible to freeze uh, this uh, diffusion mechanism? To freeze it, well, you can always freeze it, of course, by making the lattice very deep, but uh, that's not what you are, what you want to, I guess, let me see if I can, sorry, this goes slowly forward again. Ah, let me just, let me just tell it. Um, well, you can always freeze it, of course, if you make the lattice deep, but then it's a trivial freezing because you just turn the coupling to zero. Uh, so here that, this is very special transport. KPZ transport with diffu with the dynamical exponent three half, which only exists at the Heisenberg point, 
uh, if you have the integrable model underlying it uh, and you have uh, SU2 symmetry. And it's really a very, very special um, transport property that was that not only manifests itself in the transport coefficient z equal three halves, but also in this very special distribution functions. Uh, this is really actually the hallmark uh, feature of this new type of transport that you have this uh, super diffusive KPZ transport uh, in the system. And uh, yeah, for us it was important now to show in this recent experiment that you can really, by probing these different regimes, if you break, that you can, you see how this transport is also broken again, how it goes to different limits. Emmanuel, maybe a comment from, from my side. So I remember a few, a few years ago an experiment by uh, Martin Zierlein where he was looking at these sort of collisions between uh, two different opposite spin components of a 3D Fermi gas. And they, he was calling this a sort of a small uh, uh, Fermi collider or something like that. He was taking this, he was separating these two spin, different spin components and then colliding to see if they basically can diffuse or can penetrate one with respect to the other or they can bounce. So one, uh, would one imagine to do some sort of similar things here in optical lattices to basically separate two components and then let them uh, bounce one uh, Well, that's the what other. we're basically doing. I mean, what he did was in free space, right? That was the free space yeah. experiment, not a lattice experiment. So not yes. Heisenberg regime, completely different physics. So what yeah. what really have in a sense if you want this is what we're doing I mean, we're preparing this up domain wall next to a down domain wall and they are hitting each other at this clean interface and we now just turn the dynamics on and we see how this this propagates into each other how the transport how one component moves into the other component um, now i think you could have very different settings and i think you know one has to think what's interesting one can also think about having an antiferromagnetic system on the right hand side together with a ferromagnetic system on the left hand side i think there are so many different initial conditions you can think of question is of course why we have to give us the motivation to study it but i think there are many many interesting things to look at in the future okay uh so guys uh, any other questions uh, from uh, either let's see youtube here uh, so paulo nuses why is saying thanks for a great and impressive talk does anyone uh, have oh. other uh, questions that uh, want to ask here live okay so apparently there are no uh, further questions so with this uh, emmanuel i I can say from my side, it was a great uh, pleasure to have you here uh, today uh, for the beautiful talk uh, also and uh, for the discussion after the talk, which was uh, extremely interesting. And uh, I think that uh, on behalf of also of the organizers and Rodrigo, if, if you want to say any, any other word, Rodrigo, please. Uh, otherwise, we can, uh, I think we can uh, conclude here uh, the talk. Well, let me just uh, thank Emmanuel again for the really beautiful talk and uh, we're very grateful to have you here. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Really enjoyed being with you today. I'm happy from Spain <laughs> from my vacation, but uh, yeah, thanks. It was really nice. And I hope to see you soon in, in person all again. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks uh, to all the participants uh, for being with us today. Bye bye.